Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on investing in rural America. I'd like to turn it over to Chris McLean, Assistant Administrator for Rural Utility Service. Chris? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of our office hours for the Inflation Reduction Act, Powering Affordable Clean Energy Program, and the new Empowering Rural America programs. So we have some new information to share with you um, since our last get together. It's um, rewarding to see so many participants. We're in the triple digits. Looks like 150, 152 people so far. So um, welcome aboard. Um, Claire will be joining us shortly. Uh, she's apparently having some connectivity issues um, at headquarters. So um, um, I will I will begin the program um, and then we will welcome Claire as soon as she joins us. And then I am um, also joined by a number of my colleagues from the RUS program, and we'll be able to answer, we hope to be able to answer questions that you have. So uh, since we were last together, um, both of our windows for um, receiving letters of interest, LOIs, have opened for both PACE and New Era. And as you will recall, uh, the PACE um, LOI uh, processing will um, commence on a rolling basis um, in the order received. And in fact, we are doing that right now. We are um, evaluating the LOIs under the PACE program that have arrived and um, we'll be continuing to do that. So um, we are off to a good start. And then the new era LOI um, portal is now open under grants.gov. And so, um, you're uh, free to offer those LOIs as you see fit. Um, just remind you that please don't wait to the very last minute to apply because you can never tell what's going to happen with your connectivity, our connectivity, thunderstorms, power supply, whatever. Any number of things can happen. When I was in private practice, I think I've told this story before. Um, uh, I was, uh, we had a midnight deadline for a, uh, for a uh, American Recovery and Rehabilitation Act submission. And we were submitting it at 9.55 p.m. And boy, was that a close call. We got it in under the wire, but don't do that to yourself. It's, uh, it's much better to uh, give yourself plenty of time um, to be able to submit your um, application. In the new era program, just a reminder, we will be uh, reviewing those applications on the basis of greenhouse gas reductions. And so we have to have all of the LOIs in-house with the greenhouse gas data uh, attached so that uh, we can be able to uh, stack and rank all of those LOIs and to be able to move um, forward to the motion, uh, the uh, invitation to proceed. So what, I wanted, what we wanted to share with you uh, this afternoon, um, for most of you and this morning for some of you, uh, are some of our just hot off the presses published information about um, FAQs. And then we will throw the um, floor open to comments and questions. I'm not necessarily gonna go through all of these and read them verbatim, but just in time, for the first slide on FAQs is Claire. Thank you, congratulations on getting in, welcome. Um, so Claire, I will turn the floor over to you and um, the, we, can, we, we haven't started with any of the slides yet. So we just, we're just doing introductions. Okay, great. Um, well, again, sorry to be late and glad I could join. Thank you, IT team. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, we thought, you know, obviously we want to use a lot of this time for Q&A for you guys to be able to uh, continue to ask questions, but we have been very active in working to actually respond to all of the questions that we've gotten and put out actual FAQs. And it's always a lot to go through. So we wanted to use the time today to uh, go through some of the ones, recent ones that we put out. We'll be putting out another batch uh, later this week or early next week. So please continue to check in on those. Um, but this is a question we've gotten uh, quite a bit from folks is in terms of the maximum loan amount uh, or the maximum amount you can apply in a joint LOI, um, whether that $970 million is applicable to the group as a whole if you're applying together or, uh, or whether it applies to the individuals within the group. 
And the answer is, is that the statute is written um, so that that applies to the individual entities within a joint LOI uh, group. So that 970 million in budget authority uh, per the statute is really applicable to individual entities applying. So if you come together as a group, it can be over that amount is the bottom line, but not more than the 970 million per individual for budget authority. Chris, good yep. on that one? That's I, agreed. And um, I think the one maybe, uh, and, and that's when we have a, a joint application that breaks up into separate applications. If you have a joint application and you are together as a corporate entity um, with joint and separate liability, well, then your single application is is that um, that doesn't break apart. So that one, um, you, you would still have to be under the $970 million cap if you're in the joint separate liability joint application category. The next right. uh, question was on federal financing, bank conditions and penalties. Uh, if you do uh, loan modifications for stranded assets. So the answer to that question is that those FFB premiums do have to be paid, um, um, but we can fold the prepayment premiums into the uh, stranded debt refinancing calculation. So you would just um, have those premiums as, as part of what is being refinanced. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next question is about uh, the uh, ART tool, our greenhouse gas calculator tool. We were planning to, the question is, we were planning to build a new peaker plant, um, but if we're awarded funds, we can avoid that. So can we include those avoided greenhouse gas emissions in our calculation? Um, and the answer is that, you know, the ART tool does not include a specific way to include this information. You can include that in, important information in your narrative section of the greenhouse gas calculator. Um, so please do do that. But the art tool is meant to be a really simple tool um, that captures kind of a snapshot of where you are now, where you plan to be with the funding. And so it doesn't have a way to include that specifically. So you should include that in your narrative. Now, Claire, we lost we lost a little bit of your um, audio there. You, we, we could hear you, but you were coming in faintly. So I don't know if you had a microphone disconnect or not, but um, on this uh, greenhouse gas calculation question. Um, this also makes a larger point that if there is something in the uh, achievable reduction tool that you feel uh, needs some amplification or explanation, it does provide an opportunity to provide that additional information that can, and then and the agency can, uh, can take that into account and deliberate on your suggestion. So if you do have something that doesn't reflect um, a greenhouse gas reduction with the ART and you want to bring it forward, um, we would be happy to hear from you on that. I think we can go to the next slide then. All so, right. You want me to, <laughs> yeah. want me to get started? Yeah, um, this is a big one. Okay. So is the maximum limit of the $970 million, um, it, in budget authority inclusive of the loan and the grant or just the grant portion? How is the budget authority uh, that sets the maximum loan amount determined? Are there loan programs outside of new era that we can consider? Um, certainly that last one is maybe the easiest in that uh, loan programs outside of new era that you can consider. Uh, the RUS, the regular rural utility service program is a great place to go to. Um, so there are options outside, you know, if you're, if what you're seeking is much larger than that 970 million in budget authority, that is absolutely a place where you could go is to our regular program. Um, and we could can pr probably see that together, look at that together. Um, yeah, and, we don't, and, and, and I think, I think the thing, the key thing to remember, if you're trying to track where you are in the $970 million cap is remember that any grant funds you request count dollar for dollar. And then loan funds will count as a percentage. Now the percentages we are sharing with you, these are the percentages that we use for our internal calculations for the subsidy rate related to 0% as well as 2% interest rates. Those will change over time. Uh, those get re-estimated um, when the Office of Management Budget does its uh, um, interest rate estimates for the fiscal year, and it gets re-estimated at least every fiscal year. So the numbers we're sharing here 
are what we are projecting to be the subsidy rate for those interest rates in the future, they may change. They may change at the end of the fiscal year or, or before you actually uh, complete your uh, new era application. So if you're looking at how to calculate, well, okay, I, I understand dollar for dollar for the grant portion. Well, if you've got a 0% loan, in other words, a, a $100 of loan costs the agency and budget authority $42.23 in budget authority. Similarly, $19.30 for $100 of 2% or treasury rate interest loans. Last time we were together, we talked about the theoretical maximum grant amount somebody could get. What could the greatest possible level of financing be? So could, and there was a theoretical question, could someone get nine, $170 million of grant. Well, yes, they could. They have to commit to financing the other 75%. That other 75% would be financed either by yourself or with a third party. Or if you wanted to have the financing come from the RUS electric program and you were otherwise eligible, feasible, and securable, well, then you could get treasury rate of interest financing uh, for clean energy or near treasury rate of interest financing for the other 75%. So you could have 75% loan financed at treasury rates and $970 million of grants. So that is kind of like the theoretical maximum you could extract out of this um, program. So, and, and there's all the details there, but please be advised that these 42.23 and 19.30 uh, subsidy rates for interest um, subsidies are what we are projecting today. That may change. We, we may get a notification from the Office of Managed Money that they've done, a, they've done an interest rate re-estimate, and that could change up or down when it comes time for you to lock in. Bottom line is give us your best estimate of what you want to do. Um, we will do the calculations when the time comes using the subsidy rates that are in place at that time, and then we will uh, be able to offer you a package of financing if you uh, cross the finish line um, that does not exceed our statutory maximum. And, All um, right. And as we talked about, you know, some folks have asked about our regular program, you could absolutely, uh, you know, go through our regular program as well uh, for that U.S. Treasury rate loan if you wanted to try to maximize your new era dollars in other ways. That's right. We, we welcome mixing and matching with our um, existing programs. Okay. Next slide. Right, let's go next. This is another big one. I'll, uh, I'll say, if a, so if a utility deploys demand side management systems, which the utility owns, the appliances in the consumer's homes, for example, an HVAC or water heater or battery storage, over the entire useful life of those appliances, would it be eligible? Um, to be inclusive in a pay-as-you-save program um, as a, a zero emission system, basically. So here we, um, again, I won't read this for you. you. You folks can read this on the website and read it on your own. Um, the key dividing line here is ownership. If the utility owns the assets, whether and, and so the clear clearly the, the utility owns the system that connects all of those consumer devices if the utility also owns those consumer devices inside people's homes that is part of the zero emission system um which uh, could be part of a pay as you save program so this is uh i think this is a, a full exposition and um you know establishes that key dividing line of ownership and um, the ownership from the utility should cover the useful life of the devices that they are seeking to finance with PACE funding. Yeah, and we would just, I would just reiterate here that we love PACE you save systems. It's an excellent way to, uh, to go after energy efficiency benefits and things like that. We have uh, the Rural Energy Savings Program that was specifically created uh, to support pay as you save. So that is a great program for pursuing pay as you save financing. Um, and certainly 
folks could include pay as you save programs as part of their community benefit plans as well. And, and again, this is another example of mixing and matching. If, for example, you as a utility want to finance consumer ownership of consumer owned appliances, you're welcome to use the Rural Energy Savings Program to do that. And we can kind of bundle that up if, if that fits into your um, overall portfolio of actions and um, you want to secure, again, the 0% financing that the Rural Energy Savings Program provides for that relending. But clearly, if the utility owns the asset, whether it be the network that connects all those um, consumer devices or that, con that utility owns the devices that are actually in folks' homes, um, or businesses, or or um, you know, consumer wherever the consumer is, um, then then that would also be fair game for potential inclusion into um, financed new era um, projects. All right, let's go to the next one. How long? Uh, how did a long-term firm power hydropower asset compare to intermittent short-term wind and solar projects in ranking of the loan value? Can a hydropower asset use the life of the asset for calculating avoided or removal of emissions? So the answer here is that uh, you know because assets with firm power could have a higher capacity value than intermittent resources, that might be reflected. Uh, could, there could be a higher level of electricity generated which would be included in the greenhouse gas score. Um, but the longer life of an asset does not factor into the greenhouse gas calculator. It's really just a snapshot of emissions in 2022 and in 2031. Uh, I think part of the point of the answer here too, though, is the, the new air program is technology agnostic, agnostic in many ways. There might be other benefits to, uh, you know, hydropower, others, other things like higher capacity value that can be reflected. Um, and again, we're looking at the kind of totality of your proposal, but for the most part, it is a tech neutral program. Chris, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's um, yeah, that's exactly right. The way to think about the ART, the way greenhouse gas calculations are being done under this program, it's two snapshots. It's where you start. That's your baseline um, in 2022. Uh, when we first published the ART, there were some community or some um, areas that may not have had a 2022 deadline, but now we're all in 2022. So that's your baseline. And then you compare it to where you would be once you complete your um, portfolio of actions. I want to take this opportunity to remind everybody that they should be sure to use the most current version, which I think is version six on our website of the ART. Um, through these dialogues, through this, these conversations we've had over these months with uh, potential applicants, we have fine-tuned that uh, calculator. So, uh, and, and we, we appreciate all of the good advice we've received from um, our potential applicants. And so please be sure to take a look at the current version, the, the, the uh, I think it's uh, version six, that is on our website. All right, next one is, is there a required minimum percent for oh, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen required to be used? So um, our mandate is to finance um, clean energy. So uh, again, the project needs to, the, the, we can finance a portion of the project that reflects the portion of the generation that is fueled by renewables. So the loan will be, um, conditional on the portion of green fuel generation. So, and that fuel has to also be um, used for generating um, electricity. So we, we don't have a mandate just to produce fuel. We do have a mandate to produce fuel for um, uh, um, electricity uh, production. Funds under the IRA cannot be used to finance the fossil energy portion of the project. So the core RUS electric program, however, may finance the non-renewable portion of a hydrogen project. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right. So this question has come up a good bit. Are storage only proposals eligible? How do we model the greenhouse gas impacts in the achievable reduction tool for battery storage technologies or other storage assets? 
Uh, so basically the what the funding announcement says is that a energy storage needs to support greenhouse gas reduction or clean energy. And so really that's what you should be thinking about when you think about whether your storage, what you're thinking about for storage is eligible. So as the answer says here, if storage increases the energy usage from renewable energy, clean energy assets um, that are on the system or that you're creating, then a storage only proposal could be eligible. Um, or if it's significant, if you can show that it's gonna significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Again, the, the storage is only as good as I think our, one of our colleagues, Joe said, is the energy that it's storing. Um, so the additional part of this is that, you know, the art model can include and handle uh, energy storage systems and you don't need a separate template. Uh, that's done because through the annual megawatt hour output and retrieving the renewable energy from the best system, you can enter the renewable energy output. So the system, the art tools should be able to capture that. Um, and you can kind of read this more carefully. But uh, again, the kind of principle here is that if the, per the funding announcement, if the energy storage uh, supports greenhouse gas reductions or renewable energy or clean energy, then it is eligible. Um, but that's what you have to be thinking about when you think about whether or not um, you should include it or you can do a standalone proposal. All right. Uh, the next one is whether community choice aggregators qualify as cooperatives for new era programs. Well, if the community choice aggregator or CCA is a cooperative, well, then it does qualify. The statute is uh, very clear. It does restrict our, our uh, discretion. Um, and the statute does, and it's in quotes here in this response, um, is that the program is available to electric cooperatives described in section 501c12 or 1381A2 of the Internal Revenue Code um, and is an RUS current or former borrower or um, is, again, rural electric cooperative that serves a predominantly rural area. So uh, you have to be a cooperative. So if you are a cooperative, and a community choice aggregator, well then, uh, and and you serve a, a predominantly rural area or happen to be a current or former RUS borrower, then you would be in. Um, so, there, but there's, you, you, you have to be an electric cooperative as described in those two sections of the rule, I mean, of the internal re re revenue code. We can go to the next slide. Well, I'll go oh. ahead. Will the number of years for the loan or on a refinance asset be limited to the lifespan of the new renewable asset that it's replacing? Uh, so yes, the as the funding announcement states, the award term, uh, in terms of the award term, except awards that include a loan refinancing or modification, awards will be for a term not to exceed the lesser of the expected, expected useful life of the project, the term of the PPA, um, or the term, the term of the lease but the land of that project, that the, the land that that project will occupy, the expiration date of power supply arrangements um, for 35 years. So the term of an award that includes uh, loan refinancing or loan modification will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis based on the financial uh, feasibility of the award, but taking into account those elements. Hopefully that's clear in the funding announcement. Chris, anything to add there? No, I think I think you handled that very well. Um, the next one is on grid hardening and smart meter improvements, such as upgrading our um, AMI systems. So would that be eligible or upgrades to distributed resource management systems to enable voltage optimization and energy efficiency gains eligible for new era funding? So it's kind of a tricky question and it's a it's a compound question, which we probably should have disaggregated into two separate ones, but here is the key. Um, the investments themselves to be eligible for new era financing must produce a greenhouse gas reduction at the utility level. So if it's grid hardening alone or smart metering alone, metering alone and they have no impact on greenhouse gases, well, they would not be eligible. If perhaps they're part of a larger system that in fact does contribute to energy efficiency, which itself reduces greenhouse gases, well then it possibly could be um, eligible. Um, same thing about AMI, um, automatic meter interface. Um, you know, that 
that in and of itself, um, if you have an AMI that just helps you uh, collect your bills or, or measure your uh, measure your um, billing more carefully or uh, or reduce your labor costs, well, that's not necessarily reducing greenhouse gases. But if the AMI is integrated into a utility-owned demand-side management zero emission system, well, then that AMI uh, and that and that AMI reduces greenhouse gases. Well, then that could be eligible for scoring and funding. Uh, and same kind of same thing for distributed resource management system. If the distributed resource management system is attached to a clean energy source of power, well, then it may be eligible for greenhouse gases. If a distributed resource management system is attached to a fossil asset, well, then it probably wouldn't because it wouldn't be reducing greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So that is the key to um, some of these technologies. You have to be able to have a demonstrable uh, reduction in greenhouse gases to be eligible for financing. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, you know, yeah. often it is often the case with um, Durham systems or AMI systems that you can make the case that it does have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So you would just need to make that clear in your application, uh, how it relates to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Yep. All right. Okay. If a nuclear, okay, well, I'll, I'll try this one. If a nuclear project was close to or had most of its permits to comply with the IRA timeline, would RUS consider it under the new era funding as a potential project? So yes, a, a nuclear um, energy project uh, that can be completed within our time zone, our time from time frame, um, could could be an eligible activity as a zero emission system. But you got to make sure that we're able to get across the finish line in time before the end of fiscal year thirty one. Yes, we would welcome that. And then, can rural electric co-ops sell clean energy to a power marketing administration? Um, so, I think clean energy assets. Um, I think that this is the question that came up in several conversations. Could they then could could a co-op build something and then sell that asset to a mar power marketing administration? And and the answer really is, you know, awardees may only transfer assets if allowed pursuant to the terms of the Russ loan and grant documents. So you would just have to, you know, in it, you would have to follow the contractual arrangements in, you know, the award given. So it might be possible, but it would have to be reflected in that contract. Chris, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. So I mean, it's this is a, just kind of a way of it depends. You have to make sure that yeah. uh, we consent uh, to whatever uh, transfers of ownership. Um, are contemplated and please be transparent with us what you um, expect to do so that we can know uh, uh, what where where this fits into our our regulatory requirements and or or how we would want to continue con, um, condition um, awards all right the next one is if you have an existing power purchase agreement um, that is to be canceled, I would say is to be ended more accurately before 2031. And agreement is made to repower the wind farm and sign a new PPA. Uh, do we have to technically cancel the existing PPA or can we amend it and sign an extension of the PPA beyond its termination date and still qualify for new era funding? Uh, for benefits under the new era program for PPAs, uh, does an existing contract need to terminate? Existing contract um, expires in 2027, for example, or can we amend the existing contract? All right. So let's uh, kind of go down to the basics and Claire, feel free to jump in. What we want to do here in this program is to inspire new action and new investment, new purchases of clean energy. So um, if you are just going to extend a PPA um, uh, or that, um, or just have a, a PPA that you've already have in place, well, you're not doing anything new, all right? So you can submit a brand new PPA um, that would uh, extend or repower a clean asset, a clean energy asset, because that would increase as long as that increases your baseline um, greenhouse gas reductions, right? So um, 
The answer is if it's new, a new amendment that adds something new to your baseline, then it is fair game. If it's just doing what you've been doing, it's part of your baseline. And so it, I think that would, that's the distinction. Claire, do you want to add some um, additional thoughts on this one? Just, just again, it's Chris that if, if you are submitting a, something that's an existing PPA, it, you can, if, it, if the PPA hasn't terminated, but you are increasing the energy that you're getting from that PPA, maybe you're adding 50 megawatts of wind, then if it's an existing PPA, you could only apply for funding for that PPA for that 50 megawatts of additional. Otherwise, the PPA does have to end, and then you can apply for the kind of full new PPA um, that includes the additional 50 megawatts. So you, again, the principle is that it has to be additional. You've got to have additional, uh, you know, clean energy that's coming on, and, um, and it would have to be a new PPA if you want to apply for the full uh, the full cost of that PPA. Is that that's good? Right. I, I think that's right. Because the, the way you want to think about these types, types of questions is, is it adding to my clean energy mix? Is it reducing greenhouse gas reductions from my baseline? And if the answer is yes, um, I think it's, it's plausible that that could be eligible for financing. So we only have two more slides. Let's move to them quickly so we can get to the Q&A that you all have. Yes, and they're, they're piling up. So. Yeah, so we got to get moving. Um, let's go. For, so for PPA loans under the new era program, um, an applicant can request a loan for the remaining 75% with a 2% or 0% rate. Is the 0% for stranded assets only? Or is it also for serving disadvantaged communities at 40% for those served? So the, the funding announcement, um, we thought it was clear, but, <laughs> but you know, it's it's a long document. Uh, but for the 0%, if you want to request as low as 0% uh, financing, that has to be for projects that replace a stranded asset, um, that are directly replacing a stranded asset, or are for that refinancing of a stranded asset, or are for a distressed community, um, or the kind of disadvantaged communities that are outlined in the funding announcement which are basically distressed communities um, and compact states, et cetera. Anything to add, no. Chris? No, I think that's very good. And then the next question has to do with, after you receive your letter of interest, like, well then, or letter, you know, after you submit your letter of interest and you get a notice to proceed, what happens next? What if you, you know, you, we can negotiate the extension of the 60 day application window. Um, and then the question is, when will we discuss the contract terms with a potential applicant or does that occur after the application is officially submitted? So first of all, the applicant, you need to uh, tell us what you would like, how you would see that your proposals and your projects would fit under our rules. We will then review them. And as we move from LOI to invitation to uh, proceed, to the receipt of an application, to the deliberation and the underwriting of those applications, we will have discussions along the way um, and outline for you uh, whether there's going to be certain contract terms that will be required. Because it's a very wide open question. It depends on the type of applicant you are, the type of project you're pursuing. Um, but as we move down the road, you will get much more specificity and to the very end where we will have um, an agreement with um, contract terms, mortgage terms that will be able to outline exactly what your um, responsibilities are and our responsibilities. So mm -hmm. we, will, we will discuss those, but please, if there are issues that you're concerned about, put them into your application and, and, and put forward uh, what you, how you think that should be. But everything we do has to be eligible, it has to be feasible, both financially and um, technologically. It has to be securable, and of course, has to be executable within the time frame of this program. We'll go to the next slide, and I think we can go to some questions after that. Uh, is loan forgiveness available for existing loans? For example, if you have a transmission CWP West loan agreement, and those projects qualify for your funding, can we submit them for refinancing? No, the, the refinancing is really just for stranded assets under this program. So existing loans are not eligible for, for refinancing or for grants. Okay. okay. All right. If a distribution co-op is required to 
purchase all their energy through a power supply cooperative, which they are a member. Can the former be an applicant and the power supply cooperative be an off-taker? So sure, yeah, absolutely. Can work either way. And um, and GNTs and their distribution owners can also be innovative and work out arrangements where they can buy and sell power to each other if they so uh, wish. Um, but they'll have to work that out and propose that to us. I think we, that takes us to the end of the questions. Yeah. Um, before we move into the to the uh, posted Q and A's, please let me bring to everyone's attention um, that last. QR code for sam.gov. Please, if you take nothing away else from this program, please, please, please make sure your sam.gov registration is updated and current. Um, the one thing that we have experienced in the uh, early applicants of PACE, some folks were all raring to go and they found out their sam.gov application uh, number was either obsolete or it was assigned to somebody who no longer worked at the company. And so please double check, triple check your SAM, not only that you have a SAM.gov number and an, a unique identifier number, but that the person that that number is assigned to still works in your organization. So that's our big tip of the day. Um, don't, don't get caught short because SAM is beyond USDA's um, control. And sometimes that there's, there's a lot of federal programs out there and a lot of applicants trying to get SAM registrations and that system sometimes bottlenecks um, or sometimes takes time to clear. So you don't wanna be in a situation where you're on your closing days of this window and you can't get a SAM registration. So please take care of that as soon as you can. With that, why don't we go to Q and A's? Right, okay. Um, All right. You want me Michael, to get started, Chris? Michael asks, is a rural cooperative permitted to submit a PACE application for one project with themselves as the lead and then partner with a renewable developer for a different project with the developer as the lead applicant? All right, so if you're going to be in the PACE program, you get one shot. So you can be part of a, your own, you can be part of a team. Now you can be an off taker of a developer who has their own application under PACE, that, that should be okay. Um, Sean, can, uh, Sean asks, can you bundle more than one PPA in a PPA option for funding? Sure, yeah, no, that's your portfolio of actions. You can, you can put together whatever your portfolio is, and we will be glad to consider that. Chris, I feel like I'm seeing a different list of Q&A. Um, okay, you. maybe. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know where I'm. I'm, I'm at the, uh, I, I clicked on, uh, next I, one I have up is from Josh, but maybe, um, are you, tell me what you're seeing. Why don't you take whatever okay, next one I'll you take, see? I'll take one from what I'm seeing. Uh, Terrence Schuler has asked, Applicants can include the cost of infrastructure. Uh, oh, no, that, that's gone. Applicants can include the cost of infrastructure related to the delivery and utilization of PPA purchase agreements as part of their new era proposal. If using the PPA approach, can we bundle wheeling charges, transmission charges, and other delivery charges with the PPA price to determine the amount of the 25% we apply it to? I think the answer here is that you should, the PPA, PPAs often include it can include things like transmission costs and things like that. Everything has to be in that PPA agreement that you have. So you can apply for 25% of, of that whole PPA package that you are that you are looking to sign on to, um, but you can't have the PPA and then other costs outside of that PPA that you would apply to as part of that PPA. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, I think, I think that does. And here's, again, the one that I see on my Q&A list here too is from Josh, is kind of similar. So I'll read this one and, and we can uh, see if we can offer some guidance. Is it the intent of RUS to disqualify funding for any form of prepayments, front-loaded payment structures from the eligible entity to a PPA seller or would such front-loaded payment structure be acceptable subject to factors such as the project compliance with uh, 
no new ERA funds disbursed before project commercial operations is achieved or project development and construction compliance with NEPA or BABA, uh, et cetera, or eligible entity providing adequate financial security to meet RUS underwriting standards. So, all right, it's a very complex question here, Josh. And again, um, an advisory to everybody, when we answer these live streaming questions here, um, we're giving you our best um, answer, but when we go through the Q&A processes we just did, those are more vetted process projects here because sometimes they ask, you know, the person who poses the question may have something in mind a little different than the person who answers the question. So in terms of disqualifying any form of prepayment, that might be a little bit broad, but the in context of prepayments for PPAs, uh, the issue for the agency was twofold. One, we had to figure out a, me a mechanism that we could disperse funds before 2031, which is our statutory uh, requirement. Our funds literally evaporate on the last day of the fiscal year of 2031. So we had to be able to disperse those funds and we needed to be able to do so in a manner that was um, safe uh, for the taxpayer. Um, and because uh, if you were to uh, disperse those funds and let's say uh, then make one giant prepayment for 20 years to a vendor, well then, and then, then the vendor goes kaput, um, you could be out of luck. That would not be a very fiscally prudent manner of proceeding. So the compromise we came up with was we would advance up to 20 years of financing for a PPA if you're eligible and you score well, and then we would have that funds deposited into a deposit account control agreement where a trustee would let those funds out over time to ensure that um, the taxpayer gets what they pay for. And then if, for example, the project fails, or if let's say the project produces less or sells less power, uh, or the, I guess the uh, applicant purchases less power under that PPA than they had projected, the balance of the money can come back to the taxpayer um, because it wasn't used. So um, the one trick part of your question here is, are, could there be uh, some alternative where the eligible entity provides adequate financial security to meet US, RUS underwriting standards? I would say in all cases, the eligible entity must provide us financial security. We, we have to underwrite um, anyone who is going to be receiving funds. The issue isn't the eligible entity's um, uh, credit worthiness or, or financial security that the eligible entity can provide. It is one step beyond. It's the vendor to the eligible entity that we want to make very certain of. So would there be an alternative to our DACA? Maybe, um, but the DACA is the one that that is the process that we had set out for PPAs in order to walk that tightrope um, between having to release funds before the end of the fiscal year 2031, but wanting to be able to finance PPAs that extend beyond that deadline. So that that's, I think, how I would answer that one. Now, Claire, I see next up on my list uh, a question from Dan. Um, now, do you see that for renewable power? procured by a co-op through a PPA, would that be a project award or a system award or not eligible? Okay, so it could be both. It could be either one. Um, and if the, uh, uh, so yeah, it could be either one. And it, we would judge our security needs based on which one you are. So if you're a system borrower, we would look at the asset base of all of the uh, funds that, I mean, all of, all of your revenues, all your assets that you have under uh, mortgage with us, and then we make our judgment as to what we can, what we can um, underwrite. If you're a project financer, we may need additional credit support because um, it depends on what would be under that project. So it could be either. So what do you see as your next question? I, I have Terrence next. I think mine might just be a little bit delayed on delay. 
Oh, okay, um, good. So then if so you, if, I think I think we're good. Do you see Terrence Schuler's question? Can we use the PPAs for several new projects in aggregate for the application? Yes, we are caught up. So good. Great. We're in sync. Great. Um, so could, could you use the PPAs for several new projects in aggregate for the application? So if I am reading that right, do you mean could you bundle a bunch of PPAs into one PPA and then apply for that? Um, I don't see why you couldn't. I think that you would have to consider and we would want to consider the risk of that and, uh, you know, say one project doesn't end up moving forward, but the rest do, and then you've got to, you're maybe creating contractual problems by putting them all together. Uh, yeah, but there's, yeah, the there's no explicit reason why you couldn't. Right, and the agency will review each one of the PPAs. And yeah, it's possible you could be purchasing power from a network of solar facilities um, instead of just one solar facility. Um, but we will review them for um, its reasonableness and feasibility and, and underwriting. All right, well, Jeff Jeffrey asks next, language in the Federal Register states funds will be advanced upon certain milestones being achieved and per the loan documents. May funds be advanced during construction or must the project be complete and approved for operation for condition of any funding of, under the loan? Okay, Jeffrey, very good question and related to one we just answered. So if you are a system borrower, a system borrower is where the utility gives us a first lien or a shared first lien um, on all of their assets. Uh, there we can contemplate um, providing progress payments for the loan portions of uh, the um, new era program or PACE program as well. Uh, if you are a project financer, meaning that the assets that are available under um, security for us um, under a lien would be limited to that particular renewable or clean energy project. In that case, uh, the agency does not take construction risk and both the loan funds and the grant funds in the case of New Era, New Era or debt forgiveness in case of PACE um, would be held to the project being fully um, built uh, and, and operational and validated. But if you are a system financer, because we can get our security against all of the assets of the electric utility, we can contemplate progress payments as projects are being built um, uh, under the new era program. Um, Tim then asks, in what instances where <clears throat> batteries, in instances where battery storage is being added to an existing renewable source, is there a requirement that the same entity own both assets? For example, a hydropower plant that's owned by a joint venture of municipalities, and then you have the 501c312, the co-op is the operator of the plant um, and acting as the agent for the joint venture. Could that co-op apply for a new era funding to own the battery storage associated with the hydropower plant joined by the joint venture? And the answer here is yes, you can apply that. That would be an eligible form of energy storage. You're supporting uh, clean energy and the storage of clean energy, and you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions likely. And so, um, but in any case, you're supporting clean energy. And so you as the co-op could apply uh, for funding for that battery storage uh, unit or asset. Um, and then you could support that, uh, that other, the other asset, even if you don't fully own it yourself. That's right, because we would be financing the asset, which our eligible applicant, the co-op. That's the key part is it is a 501c12 that is the applicant and the owner of the asset we would be financing, and that would be A-OK. -okay. okay, Dan asked for renewable power procured by a co-op through a PPA, should a description of the generating project size location be provided in the LOI? Yes, yes, it would be. Yes, that's very good, because it also helps us determine and validate your ART. So yes, that's the answer. Yeah, um, it definitely should be included. Okay, uh, here's a quick one. Shannon, have PACE grants been awarded yet? No, they have not been awarded yet. We are processing PACE LOIs that have come in as we promised on a rolling basis. And so we are, we are putting them through their multiple levels of review. And then Faith asks, is there a document that talks about what programs are allowed and prioritized 
Yes. So the funded announcement, um, and maybe Tasha or somebody could could reply with the link to the funding announcement, but it's on the website as well, the New Era website. The funding announcement outlines what all of the eligible programs are, and then it also talks about how uh, programs will, how portfolios of actions, LOIs, will be, uh, will be evaluated in terms of scoring. Okay. Okay, Timothy asks, when do renewable PPAs need to be signed in order to be included in the new era application? Do we have to have signed PPAs prior to full application submittal? And if not, by what date? Thank you. Okay, so both at the LOI stage and at the uh, application stage, you don't have to have everything signed, right? You don't have to have your full PPA signed. As you move from LOI, to um, invitation to receive to a full application, we hope that you have a more clarity and more certainty as to what that PPA will be. We will look at draft PPAs in the application process. At the LOI stage, you just have to be able to tell us with the uh, reason that you can get a PPA signed. When we move to the applications, we wanna be able to see that the um, hope of a PPA is, is more realistic. And so then, they don't have to be fully executed by the time you submit your application, but they will likely, I mean, if, if, if your PPA is a big part of your um, project, well then, uh, you know, you, we, would, we would certainly have to have them executed um, before we can um, advance any funds. But uh, as you get closer to the application date and deeper into this process, you should be much more closer to having them signed, but they don't absolutely have to be fully executed uh, because frankly, you're waiting to find out whether you're gonna get the funding and you won't know get the funding until we get the final signature. So uh, we understand that, um, but as we move through, they have to be much and more, much closer to certainty than they were when we started. And uh, I have the next up I have is Jessica. I have concerns with some of the inputs in the greenhouse gas tool pertaining to emission estimates that are fixed. Can these estimates be modified to reflect emission levels that vary dramatically from region to region? So we had a lot of conversations about this with uh, creating the greenhouse gas tool. Um, in the end, you know, there's a lot of different tools out there. A lot of them like eGrid and others do take into account where the emissions are and the region where the emissions are. Um, for the simplicity of the art tool, we have, for the most part, not included that. Um, again, it's meant to be able to be a very simple tool that nobody has to, you know, take a course in learning or hire a consultant to be able to use. Um, but if you feel like it doesn't fully reflect emissions reductions that you will be achieving, you can, again, put that in the text um, of the greenhouse gas tool in that separate tab where you can provide um, some actual language around what you, how you think the tool doesn't fully capture your emission reductions. Maybe you're in an area where, you know, there's very high carbon intensity in the grid. And so you're, you know, writing in to reflect that. And, and that else? was, yeah, and that was a twofer because that was, uh, that answers also Joe's question. Uh, which is about the same item, but yeah, let us, if, if you think that there is something that, we're not taking into account in the ART that you think is relevant that affects your greenhouse gas reductions, please let us know. We, we can't promise you we will agree with you, but we will certainly promise you that we will deliberate on it and take it into consideration. All right, Scott asks, does the purchase under a new era have to be tied to a specific asset? Would a purchase from a portfolio of 100% clean assets qualify? So we have to know what you're purchasing and from whom you're purchasing it. Um, and again, I think you hit you hit the high point there. Uh, we do have to know that it's a, a clean energy asset. So um, I think we I think that's something we would be willing to look at. But bear in mind we have to know exactly what we're financing uh, to, in order to be eligible. So if it's not specific enough, um, we may not be able to get there. But I, I think, you know, you can imagine a vendor that 
has some verifiable method of providing 100% clean power from a variety of assets. Um, Claire, do you have any thoughts on that? Just that, just that I think that, you know, we would have to see what this exactly looks like, because we do have to be able to also say, um, you know, this is what, these are the consumer benefits of the new era funding. You know, this is what the cost reduction is. What would be, this is what the cost would be without new era funding. This is what the cost would be with new era funding. And this is how consumers are going to benefit. Um, we would, we would normally want to see a lot of things that you could pretty easily reflect in a power, like a regular power purchase agreement around a specific asset. But if you can show us all of those things through a, a kind of 100% clean power PPA, then I think that we would certainly be able to consider that. Okay. And then Samantha asked, if we enter into a PPA and the solar facility keeps the RECs, is the PPA still eligible under new era funding? Um, and the answer is yes. You know, we, we are not involved in RECs and uh, that system of things. If, if you are purchasing the power and it's clean energy for your members and it's going to be reducing costs for your members and providing cleaner energy for your members, then uh, that is eligible and we are agnostic as to where the RECs go. It is still important for us to know about the RECs. Uh, exactly. That's part of, that's part of your, the financial feasibility. Um, and so that, that could weigh into the financial feasibility. So please do. As, do as, as well as, right, as well as consumer benefits. So, but yes, you, you, you can structure these arrangements, but what we expect to see is that um, by the virtue of these financial incentives that your consumer benefits. And so we want, we want to make sure that that's part of this. All right, Wilhelm asks here, um, if an electric cooperative already owns real property and other infrastructure that can be utilized for a renewable energy project, will it somehow be given credit or preference for dedicating such assets to a proposed project compared to projects that are true greenfield projects requiring the purchase of real estate and the procurement of other supporting infrastructure. Um, not, I wouldn't say any preference. Um, uh, you know, it may reflect in terms of the cost of your um, investment, your cost of your project. And among the things the ART does provide us is an affordability calculation, both in terms of what it means for consumers as well as it means for our program. So to the extent that the ART uh, would say that, you know, between two equally scoring greenhouse gas reducing projects, the one that is cheaper might outrank the one that is more expensive. Uh, but, uh, you know, how you structure your projects, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have assets available, that gets you a more affordable project for your consumer, which advances the goals of the program, and that would be reflected in one of the outputs of the art. Great. Um, great explanation, Chris. And Douglas asks, regarding the art, if the EV charging station is grid connected, does it reflect the greenhouse gas emissions profile of the local grid? Does it also break this down by time of use, daytime, nighttime? Um, so I think, first of all, just to be clear, you are including EV charging stations in your proposal. You would need to make sure that the utility is owning those, the co-op is owning that as, as part of a kind of management system for managing the energy uh, on the grid. And in terms of the greenhouse gas profile uh, of a local grid and how that would be uh, Ranked, I actually, Chris, I would throw that to you. Yeah, because I, I think that, right. I mean, it's, it's more than that because the EV charging station, I mean, for an e, let me put it this way, for an EV charging station to even be thought of as being eligible, it would have to contribute to greenhouse gas reductions of the utility. And right? so you don't get to grab the greenhouse gas reductions of the driving public um, with an EV charging station. So you'd have to be able to somehow show that the charging station itself is reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of the electric utility for it to even be um, eligible. Um, so that's now, I mean, I guess you could imagine charging stations that are part of a connected demand side management system that would fit in there, you know, uh, demand uh, fit into our zero emission system statutory uh, requirement. You'd have to explain how that 
maybe you use the charging stations or charging plus storage to somehow uh, manage loads and reduce greenhouse gases. But you'll ha you you have to to get to get eligibility for any individual element for funding under this program, you have to be able to show that we're reducing greenhouse gases. That, that's, that's the key element of the program. Okay, is there a word limit or any other guidance available for what can be included in V notes of the ART? I don't think we have a word limit. Um, we, we just wanna know. We ask you to make it concise and readable. We, we you know, uh, 150 page thesis is is a little hard for us to get through but if you know a, a concise and 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 thoughtful um expression is is what we request so no we, we don't have a we don't have a word limit yep and carlos asked for applicants who are gnt cooperatives with proposed generation transmission that would impact their gnt bulk system across their territory can you confirm that the service area and associated shape out with their entire gnt service area yes yep Yep, yep, that's right. It's who's benefiting from the project that you're proposing. And I'm going to have to jump off, uh, but we have uh, amazing other colleagues as well to so, to work with you, Chris, on answering the rest of these, Jamie and Don and Bob and Ken and others. So if somebody wants to jump on with their screen as well uh, to right. work with Chris and answer. Right. Them, that would be okay, great. whoever. All right. We, that's thank you, Claire. And thank you for joining us. And um I will invite um, either Jamie or Bob to jump on and we can trade off these questions. Um, we're making good progress here and uh, we, we can, I can, I can go the distance. So thank you, Claire. Thank you all, take care. All right. Well, I will, while, while uh, Jamie and Bob sign on, I'm gonna go to Brent's question. Followed a question from Carlos uh, Sedeno. Verifying the 1500 word winning is not, tied to the entire technical description of the LOI template. So we have a brief portion discussing project name and brief description, then the actual action that reduces greenhouse gases, a reduction in the portfolio of actions, and that is where the 1500 word limit is correct. So yeah, Brent, I think that's correct. Um, um, again, when you're addressing the ART or the greenhouse gas reductions, again, we don't have a limit, and your limit is on the projects. Um, just, you know, ask you to be concise, um, and, and uh, we'll, you know, if you need, if, if you need some additional information that explains your um, submission, you know, that, that should be, that should be okay. All right. Rock asks, um, if a project applicant submits a portfolio of different projects within the same LOI, say three to four projects for their portion of the grant, how would RUS go about inviting that project applicant for a full application? It's my understanding that RUS will be evaluating total greenhouse gas emission reductions across the, hell of, uh, across the whole of the LOI as a holistic review. But if there are some more solid projects within the portfolio, how would RUS evaluate that? Okay, well that's, so Rock, I am assuming that your question here applies to a um, multiple um, applicant LOI. So it's a coalition LOI, let's say of three or four, not only three or four different projects, but three or four different applicants. So as we move from LOI, and uh, split up into individual applications and individual invitations to apply. We will then deal with one of the individual, um, each individual component um, in their own merit. Now, as we're considering the LOI, you know, we'll be looking at those portfolio of actions. If something is really weak, we may say, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to fund this particular component, or we might be able to fund this particular component if you give us some more information and strengthen it, strengthen it further. All right. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Anna Kess asks, let's see, to follow up with Carlos asks, 
we're specifically asking if the section H in the LOI has a word limit of 1,500 words, or just subclose X plus three, I also want clarification on this. All right, I will have to then go and look. Let me, let, me, uh, let me ask our team to be able, if anybody wants to take a look um, at those two subsections, let me know. But uh, again, if you can give us information that's concise and to the point and useful, that will be, I think, helpful to us. All right, now Josh asks about um, TUP. So TUP is total utility plant. Regarding calculation of TUP, is it intended to be gross TUP, original capitalized costs plus all capitalized additions and improvements, or net TUP, which would be the gross TUP minus depreciation taken since the plant's inception? I believe it is to be the gross. And I think we actually have a TUP Q&A on that very point. Samantha asks, if we are submitting a co-application, can we do that if there are two separate projects, PPAs? Sure, you could have two um, applicants in a single LOI, each with their own PPA being submitted each with their own combined TUP is their category, and then each with their combined um, greenhouse gas uh, reduction calculation to see where they um, enter in the ranking of the project. So that would be okay, as I understand that question. So Chris, I'll, I'll jump in and read one of the next well, questions. Well, Just Jamie, I am so glad to see you. Thank you, I've been waiting. I'm good. See, I, I would take going, a breath and a drink. I was on video, but I don't. I don't think that you could see me at first. You were no, I, I couldn't see you at all. So I, great, thank you, great. Jamie. So the, the, next the next question one. we see with Carlos: Can a timeline identified in Section I of the LOI sample be a list of table, be a list or table of milestones with dates for each project in the LOI, or is there a requirement for a timeline graphic? Um, example: the Gantt chart. Great question, Carlos. Um, this could be either a, a Gantt chart or this can be a list, whatever is the best way for you to describe the timeline. Again, we want it to be as organized as possible and, and just meeting the elements of what's gonna happen with the project, when the money would come, what's gonna happen next with the construction, et cetera. As we move from the LOI stage to the application stage though, we will then convert any charts or graphs to um, verbal, you know, commitments that will be reduced to words because we will have right. contractual agreements that you will you will perform certain things at certain times. So, so yes, but fine at the LOI stage. Yeah, however you best can convey it, um, and 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 uh, yeah, that that would be fine either way. All right, Aaron right. asks. I'll go to Aaron next, and then we'll switch off. How about that, uh, That's Grant? Great. Okay, two, grant must be securable, meaning assets finance with a grant must be secured by first lien in favor of RUS metal measures. Credit support, is the PPA considered an asset? So yes, the PPA, um, this is one of those questions I'm going to, um, it's, it's a little bit broad and um, we're going to be providing some further guidance. Um, we, we are actually working on some further guidance on exactly the security arrangements we would like to see for grant funded assets. And I'm assuming that this question applies to a pure grant. If we have a loan grant combination, the security requirements for the loan portion covers the grant portion because in a, uh, so, so that's, that's, I'm gonna assume that this question applies to grant only. Uh, please um, watch for our website. Um, and again, I'm asking the team, we'll maybe kind of um, bookmark this one so that we can make sure that either this question gets answered or that the answer that we are prepared to publish shortly um, would answer this. Um, bottom line is we wanna make sure that the taxpayer gets what they pay for. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, um, at a minimum, 
uh, that the RUS consents to any transfer of assets after the grant award has been made and that the grant investments continue to perform over time as promised. So, uh, but we'll be giving you more detail on that later. Okay, so the next question from Aaron is grants. Oh, wait a minute, there it is. If applicable, the eligible entity must provide the balance sheet and income statements for the last three years of the entity or entities providing equity or security for the award together with an explanation of legal relationship among the legal entities. AMP will sign a PPA with renewable developers, and then AMP will have a separate PPA with each of its member communities. Do we need to provide the balance sheet and income statements for all of our members that will be participating in the PPA? Um, that's a great question, Erin. The financial statement sheet should be provided for those that are applying. And, and let me know if I, if I misspeak on this one, Chris. So in this example, um, the financials will be provided with those that are on the application, not necessarily. So, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right. Is that so? AMP. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's the uh, and I think I know who a. I mean AMP would be the applicant, mm -hmm. and the applicant would be the one that has to provide us the financial information. Correct. The customers of the applicant or the folks that receive the um, power. Mm -hmm. um, for the purposes of the LOI, would not require to submit all of their um, financials. We may ask for additional information if we don't fully understand the transaction. Um, right. But what we are interested in is the financial feasibility of the applicant to be able to bear their share of the cost and to be fully able to execute the um commitments of, of the program. So yeah, in this case, again, assuming that AMP is the applicant, AMP would be the ones that has to provide us their financials, AMP's customers. We may wanna, we will take, we will certainly along the process wanna look at the PPAs with your customers and we may ask them additional questions as to whether those customers themselves are credit worthy. But um, at the LOI stage, you don't, you don't have to worry about the customers yet. All right, let's see who is next here. Aaron. Okay, in instances where battery storage is being added to an existing renewable resource, is there a requirement that the same entity own both assets, for example? Okay, I think we just had this question. For example, a hydropower plant that is owned by a joint venture. Okay, we did answer this one um, earlier. And I think in that case, um, the battery storage, if it's owned by the applicant who is an eligible 501c12, that would be fine if it's storing power from someone else's um, clean energy source, then you meet the requirements of the new era program. So I think that could be um, financeable. Okay. So I'm gonna just skip around for a little bit because one question um, seemed to be a little bit similar to some of the others. Will mortgage terms be the only type of loan terms offered? Um, and Shelby just wanted to know more if 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 you're asking about the the tenor and um, and the repayment structure, but there will have to be a, a clear case of, of reasonable repayment. Um, the feasibility of the technology and the primary source of repayment with the balance sheet. So hopefully that's helpful in yeah. that one. I think it's very important to stress all projects, all loans have to be secured. Now they can be secured through a mortgage. Mm -hmm. They can be secured if you like, for example, a G&T, you may not have a mortgage. You have, a, you have an indenture, which is an intercredit agreement that protects all of the creditors under the terms of the indenture. Um, and um, our U.S., though, expects to be in a first position um, or a shared first position. So the projects have to be securable. There are also alternatives to mortgage or indentures where perhaps there's a third party providing a guarantee. Some cases you may have an applicant that has very small amount of assets 
but they may have a third party that is willing to guarantee the repayment of the loan. And, and that might be something that we would consider. But our typical customer um, would have either a mortgage or an indenture. All right, so I'm gonna go to Shelby's question, uh, which says, would an award for a late decade project change if the project specifications change from what we submit in our application? For example, the project size, timeline, or technology. All right, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, and I'm gonna change it a little bit, um, project size timeline. One, we have to be able to execute completely by the date, um, uh, the last date of the program, which is the last date of fiscal year, 2031. And in fact, you'll have to have it executed and you'll have to have it built, delivered, tested, validated, well before that, because we are not going to wait till the last day of the fiscal year to advance funds. So that's that's number one. So please be as realistic as you can um, in your LOI and and as realistic as you can in your application if you advance to that stage. We understand that technology can change over time. For example, um, if you have a project that has battery storage, battery storage over time is getting better and better. So. If when you are ready to deploy, you can actually store more power than you had anticipated, well, that's a good thing. And we will work with you on that. In terms of project size or project timeline, kind of similar, if, if your project timeline accelerates, that's great. If your project timeline slows down and it takes you to the other side of our deadline, well, then that's not so good. You could, you could end up losing out. So it's gonna depend on what the project does. In terms of project costs um, and, and project dollars, there we do have much more limitations because we have this money available and when this money is gone, it's gonna be gone and it's gonna be obligated to other folks in, we hope, by late decade changes. But so please be as realistic as possible. We are, we are ourselves though realistic that um, we don't want you to have, uh, have to drive last year's car um, when you could get next year's car for a lot cheaper and it could do a lot more than, than the current technology. Awesome. Um, the next question, Kathy, does the project proposer need to retain the rights to the environmental attributes or can they sell them and still be eligible for new error? And I'm not sure what yeah. environmental attributes means, Cassie. So um, I'm going to take a pass on this one. Uh, we need to retain the rights environment. I, I guess if this is the question about the RECs, um, the, the answer that Claire gave is that we certainly want to know about RECs. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly want to know because they, they are an important element of financial feasibility and consumer benefit. Um, but you can structure a transaction that does um, monetize those recs, um, and we, but we would want to know about them so that we can see how that influences the, the process. All right, I'll go to Brent's question next. Regarding loans for PPAs, we understand the grant portion goes into a DACA account. Our question is, if you also get a loan for the reigning 75%, will that go into the DACA account too? Yes, um, yes, because I have, to dis I have to disperse those loan dollars before 2031. So if you want to get those loan dollars, um, then for them, they have to be dispersed and they have to be dispersed somewhere. And we've determined that the place that they'd be dispersed would be the DACA. So um, that is correct. Uh, just as the numbers are changing for the participants, I'll jump down to two of the most recent questions, which are actually three questions pertaining to our Q&A. Yes, there will be a transcript for today's session. Um, and I don't know that that will be added to the FAQ, but this will be made available should any of our responses have varied from the FAQs. The next question about sharing our contact information, Tasha has dropped that information into the webinar chat. 
And um, and then another question was about the FAQs. Those will be updated as well, but we wanted to verbally go over them today. So there are about four questions I've seen like that. Uh, okay. We wanted to address those earlier on. All right, very good. Um, in fact, the last slide of our presentation is uh, contact information and those QR codes we had in the uh, slide presentation also will take point, you to Chris. our U.S. website. Love those QR codes. That was um, yeah. something good that came out of the last couple of years. Just scan your phone and boop. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot easier than searching <laughs> for them in the, on Google or el elsewhere. Um, yeah. I think we answered Aaron's question here about do um, the renewable PPAs need to be signed in the application. They do need to be signed uh, shortly after we've completed our agreement, and they certainly have to be signed before we release any funds. So um, as you move through, we know that you will be um, not having everything finished. When we get to the application stage, probably we would like to be able to see what the draft um, PPAs look like. Okay, there's a question. Um, can company A lease a land in Justice 40 from company B for those programs or company A has to own the land? I'm gonna read that again. Can company A lease a land from company B for these programs, or does company A, the one that was going to do the leasing, have to own the land? Okay, so um, you, you can lease property. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to be a capital lease. We'll, we'll need to know about that lease. Right. Um, and the lease of the land affects the term of the financing. So... So we if it's shorter go, than the financing, if, then... Right, if, if, mm -hmm. if the useful life of the... Let's say it's a solar facility. If the useful life of the solar facility is 20 years, but you only have a lease for 15 years, uh, we're only going to finance... We're going to finance closer to the 15 years, not the 20 years, because you could lose your lease. So yes, you can lease, you can lease your land, um, and um, we will take that into account. Okay. Um, for PACE, here's from David's question. For PACE with a nonprofit applicant, can the offtaker be the Tennessee Valley Authority? Sure. That'd be great. No, no problem. With PACE, though, of course, you you know, um, PACE is considered on a on a rolling basis, and but that that's an acceptable offtaker. All right, let's see, where do we want to go next? Um, okay, Maria asks, if there is a large co-op that is considering signing a new 20-year PPA agreement for the entire output of a potential clean energy source, um, since the co-op cannot handle all of the output power, they are in discussions with four other co-ops to sell the excess power. All involved co-ops are Section 501c12s and current or former RUS borrowers as required eligibility for new era. If they all intend to submit LOIs for potential participation in new era, what funding will be available to each? Well, I think if they, if we, if this is just a PPA, uh, we would look at each entity's PPA. Um, so, so for the other eligible applicants, they would want to look at the, we would want to look at what we're financing. We wouldn't finance the same PPA twice though. So um, yeah, I, if I understand your question correctly, um, if you've got other co-ops that are eligible for financing under this program, and let's say you are all in this, maybe a single LOI together in order to share the value of that score, well, then we would we would look at what it would take to finance um, the, the constituent components of this. Now we may may have to net out your sub um, owners, or I mean sub purchasers, right? So 
if you're going to buy 100% of the power, the, if one of the applicants can buy 100% of the power, and let's say for sake of argument, um, the four others are going to buy 20% of the power, um, we're going to only finance 100%, but, but we would finance each constituent part um, if, if they were across the finish line, based on how I understand this question. <laughs> so I put a proviso out there that we want to be able you know, explain to me, to explain to us how you want to do this, and we'll take a look at it. But that does seem like um, it's got the magic words: 501c12 co-op participants and a uh, hundred percent clean energy source. So that sounds like a, a good, good idea there. So, so speaking of parts, I'll jump in with Scott's question about. How would a battery be considered if it is being charged from the grid, which may or may not be made up of renewable energy, depending on when the battery is being charged? Good question, Scott. And we've had this in, in different variations. Ultimately, the battery must be charged from a renewable source. So that could come from solar or wind or hydro, um, but it cannot be a mix of the grid because the grid may have an energy source that is not of renewable. Um, and we've heard different parts. What if the battery is charged during a time where it's only solar, but that is that is such a nuance that is unclear if it's charged from that solar or if it's still being charged from other sources. Yep. Yeah, so you have to, that's the key to make a battery part of a zero emission system is that it has to be able to get zero emission or clean energy source of um, power. Because otherwise, you're just storing. If you're you're storing the non-clean energy, correct um, power, and and not necessarily reducing greenhouse gases. And even if you were reducing greenhouse gases because of time of use, it probably probably wouldn't score very well in any event. But your strongest case to make a battery eligible is that battery. You can show us that that battery is going to be charged with a clean energy source. Okay, let's go to um, Alap says, since in most cases, the loan proceeds will only be provided once the project is completed and verified by USDA and meet the greenhouse gas commitments, is the idea that the co-op will secure a loan from a third party during the project and then refinance with the USDA 0% or 2% loan once the project is complete? Okay, good question. Again, depends on which category of financing the applicant co-op is seeking. If the applicant co-op is seeking a um, system loan, um, or let's say that applicant is a, a current or current borrower, um, and we already have a system loan, then, um, you potentially could use those loan proceeds to um, finance during constructions if you're otherwise financially feasible. If it's project financing and um, you're um, seeking um, you know, project financing, we would release both the loan funds and the grant at the end once everything is, via, everything is delivered and validated. So we won't be taking construction risk for project financing we're willing to take reasonable construction risk for system financing. And then yes, you would need a third party entity to be able to provide the interim financing during construction. We will take that into account. We wanna make sure that that third party is capable of doing that as well as you're capable of repaying that to make sure that your project is otherwise okay. Okay. And Chris, you um, this will be my last question before 3.30. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a good one, um, and they're all great questions. For <laughs> they're all great questions. They are some of these. I had to make a note. I said we're gonna have to talk about this again. For pace and new error LOIs are being evaluated on a rolling basis based on the order received. Will invitations for application be extended on a rolling basis as well, or will all invitations be extended on a certain date? Um, okay. David, so there's a difference in the pace and the new error process. Pace is on a rolling basis. New error is on a competitive basis. So the ones that score the best will be invited for an invitation to proceed with an application. 
pace and the order of which they are received will be reviewed and then invitations extended. Um, so that's the difference between the pace and the new error will not be on a specific date for pace. Um, and new error, uh, that will, I don't know if all of them will be made at the same time, but they will all be evaluated. Yeah, uh, we, are, we are sequentially reviewing the PACE LOIs that are in-house already. Correct. Now, we won't stop the production line if, let's say, someone in uh, position number five, we have some additional questions. We won't just stop all work until we get that answered. We'll mm -hmm. maybe, you know, go to position number six and go to the next one. But in general, yes, we, we're reviewing them on a rolling basis. And then... Um, we have not yet issued any um, invitations to proceed. We are getting close to the point where we could be starting to um, offer some early ones. Um, but it is, uh, it is a multi-step review process. And so um, just hang in there. It's going to take us a little while <laughs> to be able to get through all, all of these uh, um, LOIs. And, um, but we are, as promised, reviewing them on a rolling basis. We are, we are. And a lot of questions remaining are technical. So hopefully Ken and or Bob will jump on with you, Chris. I've enjoyed this. We'll have to do this more. I see why you and Claire have so much fun uh, with office hours. So yeah, no, it's great. It's great to have you, Jamie. And uh, so Jamie, thank you very much for joining us. And I will invite um, Bob or Ken or whoever else wants to jump on if you want to trade off with me on some of these uh, questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to jump in here. Keep it going. Hey, Chris. Let's see. Chris, I'll take one or two. Okay, Bob, why don't you, why don't you start? And I'm going to start at the bottom. Okay. okay. Uh, Judith asked the question of, do you include all of the documents sent in the LOI again with the application when asked to participate in the application process? It, effectively, yes, but you want, probably want to update them as necessary. Um, uh, in the in the application, but yeah, the, basically the information that's in the LOI is evaluated, and we expect basically the same information in in the application as well. Okay, okay, very good. Um, and I'll take yeah, the next. And it's one. like we're yeah, gonna. Go ahead, uh, sometimes I know federal agencies can be annoying asking for the same things over and over again, but time passes between the LOI and the application. Uh, window and we sometimes just want to make sure that okay is this current as of today um, and, and yeah for instance a, a balance sheet you know, it could it could transfer from one fiscal year to the next you know from your perspective so um, we would require the the most updated information um, same thing for uh, for if a PPA has been has been revised or updated we'd look for that updated information. Okay. All right. I can uh, take one question. This go is ahead, Ken. Ken. Thank oh, you. Yeah, Justin McCann, can interconnection facilities used for co-located solar and, and, and battery energy uh, storage systems be included as part of the PACE LOI in application? Yes. <laughs> Tough answer. Tough answer. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good, good to have both of you guys on board. Let's see. Let me um, let me find one here. How? Okay, I'm going to ask Stephanie's question. How flexible is the 60-day window for submitting an application following a successful LOI? Um, we'll be flexible but reasonable. Let us know what time you know, what how much time you need. We know that we have some folks that are raring to go. They got projects that they can't wait to get underway. So they're gonna have, they may not, they may not even need 60 days to apply. We also know because we're trying to inspire new action from people to that um, they may, may need a little time to line up all of their resources and get all their ducks in the row to put the application together. So please let us know how much time you need. Um, the time you need will also be dependent on the time we have to be able to execute all these projects. But we, we uh, please, it's 60 days or a date that is mutually agreeable to us. And we're pretty agreeable people um, as long as it's reasonable. 
Good one. Uh, I'll take Julie's. Um, sample LOI identifies the need for a technical description that has several elements in it, including the 1500 word portfolio of actions. Two questions. One, is the portfolio of actions to be a separate standalone doc that is separately uploaded into the SF424? It actually will be separately loaded into the grants.gov website. So it's, it won't be done into the 424 itself necessarily, but it, it will be part of what's required in, at grants.gov. And two, uh, can you speak more to your expectations for content for the portfolio of actions as the sample LOI just states the need to provide a summary of the technical aspects of the programs? Um, and then can you provide an example? Hopefully Ken will be able to do that one. But um, yeah, in essence, what we're trying to do with the 1500 word limit is, is ask you to be brief. OK, um, we're, we're we're trying, as Chris said before, we're trying to limit this from, uh, you know, from a doctoral thesis down to, to something at the LOI stage, especially that um, gives us the information we need in, in a relatively concise document. Because remember that we're reading a bunch of these and uh, and, and frankly, the intent of the letter of interest is uh, is just to determine basic uh, applicability at this stage so that we can go beyond that. Uh, you can go beyond that with your application and provide a more detailed answer. Okay, very good. Ken, you wanna take one? I'm searching. <laughs> okay, well, while you search for the next one, Ken, I will try a stab at Carlos's question. Will RUS allow applicants to redesign their funding type and mix during an application stage if the projects proposed in the LOI are not approved in full, as is, or fall through, i.e., in response to any changes in the project scope? So I'm going to answer that question, Carlos, with a great big, it depends on the materiality of those changes. Uh, we have to be fair to everybody. We're asking folks in the LOI to be as, you know, as realistic and specific as they can. We also know that as we are trying to inspire new action, you may be proposing something in the LOI stage that is still aspirational. And when we get to the application stage, um, there may be some bumps along the way or some changes along the way. I would say that we will be, we understand that. However, we have to be fair um, to everybody else. Um, if those changes affect what your overall score would be, that might be relevant. And again, the nature and scope of that is so, again, in the LOI stage, try to be as realistic as possible. Um, we know that you don't have to have everything completely sewn up. You know, there may be some details uh, or some potential changes, uh, but we want to make sure that, uh, again, you're able to deliver what you promise in the LOI stage. Um, and so the answer to your question, again, is it will depend. Did you find one you like there? Ken, to answer? Well, and you can answer answer the questions about uh, 1970.54. Um, well, well first, but first of all, I wanted to touch base on a question that was previously answered by you, Chris, regarding uh, environmental attributes. Oh, and, sure. Yes, please do. Yeah, let, let me clarify that. It, it, the answer is that if you intend to include the purchase of Rex or environmental attributes as part of the PPA. The idea is that you're going to be retaining those and using them for yourself. You shouldn't be turning around selling them to another third party because we wouldn't want to finance something that you're going to be selling. The idea is you should be retaining them. You should retain the rights to those. Okay. Okay. I'm going to then take uh, Melanie's question. If an electric co-op wants to apply for grant only and their total utility value falls into category one, can they apply for more than 25% of the total project cost or is 25% the max regardless? 
So yes, the 25% of grant support to the total project um, is statutory. So we have absolutely no discretion. So Congress um, has laid that out for us. And in our funding notice, we say that the uh, grant support that is available is up to 25%. So nobody's guaranteed that they're gonna get the full amount, um, but, but it is absolutely guaranteed that I cannot exceed 25% grant support um, under the terms of the statute. All right. Um, how about this one, Ken? We'll see, I'll, I'll pose this one and we, you can maybe yeah. help me out with the answer. Okay, this is from Anekes here. Um, we are proposing to sign a new PPA for a renewable asset located in an organized regional market. In addition to the PPA price, the project will include, oh, I think we did answer this, in projects transmission costs to facilitate the delivery of power to our service territory and adjacent transmission system. Are these transmission costs eligible for new era funding? And that's a quick one. I think that that's a yes, um, it could be, as long as that's that those related costs necessary for you to receive the PPA power, um, right. you can include that, right? Right, right. right. You, you'd be eligible to for, for us to finance the cost of whatever you're paying for the power from under the PPA, but realize that those transmission costs will have to are subject to NEPA. So. Right, the, the new construction. For, right. Or any upgrades related to financing those upgrades will, will be subject to NEPA, but not the actual purchase of the power under the PPA. That's right. Okay. Another uh, question from Anna Kess is, for 0% loans, at the minimum, if there is even one Suda community served within the co-op's entire service area, does that make them eligible? Okay. Well, the zero percent. So it's a kind of a. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, variability in that question. So I'm going to ask have a couple assumptions here. Um, so if you've got a service area and you do have a Suda area, well, that Suda area might be eligible for uh, zero percent loans but just if you happen to have a suda area in your service territory that doesn't automatically make you eligible for zero percent loans in the whole service territory so we're going to have to look at um, your uh, your total eligibility and what you're going to do to qualify for the zero uh, up to zero up to zero percent um, or as low as zero percent financing i'll take okay. I'll take the one by Daniel Vago. It's similar to one I've already answered. It says, do RECs have to be included in a renewable PPA and retired by the applicant to qualify? What type of reporting requirements will there be for a zero emissions PPA that might come from more than one asset? Well, first of all, in the first questions, the RECs do not have to be included as part of the renewable PPA. But if they are, we will finance with the understanding that you will retire and not sell those recs to anybody else. Okay. The other th question, what type of reporting requirements will there be for zero emission PPAs that might come from more than one asset? Well, that's fine. They can come from more than one asset provided those assets that meet the requirements for when it was built. And when you entered into the PPA, the PPA can include buying power for more than one asset. That's fine, as long as it's well established in the terms and conditions of that PPA. Okay. I'll take Brent's question on once you receive the notice to proceed, then is the application going to look like a normal RUS loan application? Basically, I mean, there's there's other additional information there. Um, we're going to require more specific mapping information. Um, and and obviously we're going to have some some questions particular to um, to the to this particular program. But yes, the majority of it is is much like it would be for an RUS loan. All right, good. Um, so I'm going to ask maybe some help from my great engineers, Bob and Ken here from Jessica. 
Large transmission projects require time-consuming permitting reviews and easement approvals in certain states and jurisdictions that may not be completed until 2028. How do we consider the eligibility of such projects if we cannot draw funds until 2029? So you are definitely, Jessica, within the 2031 timeframe. You're got, cutting it close there. Um, but uh, yeah, we know there are queues. Do you have any um, comments or advice, Ken, on the queuing with the uh, a, a permitting and pr approval process? Uh no, but but it, it well in a way uh, we it is an eligible project, and obviously obviously when it becomes well better defined, we'll be able to provide you know, and obligate funds. Um, we can obligate funds, and Chris, you can provide more clarity on this one with the idea that the environmental could be completed within the next fiscal year. And yeah. And you want to be careful, though. Yeah. And and the other part of environmental review, permitting route as well, might be that get as early a start as possible. Um, you don't have to uh, have all your financing approved before you can start your environmental review. If you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to do and you feel like you're in the running for this funding, well, you might want to start the environmental review already. Um, yeah, Chris, they, the, the question didn't, I didn't see whether it was going to be project financing or whether it was actually an existing borrower. Um, and that would affect how we advance funds on that as well. True, true, right, right. And, and you wouldn't, um, and you wouldn't begin construction prior to the environmental review being complete because that oh, would absolutely rule you out. Right. Okay, if using a grant for battery storage, does the grant apply pre-ITC or post-ITC from Victoria? That's um, a good question. Um, I think our grant would, well, we can't speak for Treasury on how they will um, address this. We think we know how they will address it but we would be making our grant um, based on the cost of the project and to the fact to the extent you can get an investment tax credit that certainly will be relevant into our financial feasibility but we would look at what the cost is uh, of of the battery storage system in your example and then make our determination and funding decision based on that cost and then your your ability to recoup costs from the Department of Treasury through investment tax credits um, certainly would be relevant to our consideration of underwriting, but we wouldn't be discounting what we finance by what you may get in investment tax credit. And as I understand the way the system will work, we would be in the position first of approving and validating funds um, before the investment tax credit, you would get the investment tax credit if, if we, um, yeah, typically we would probably come first in the validation process. All right. Let's see. Um, is, oh. uh, Kat okay. say it. Catherine. David's got one. Is there a mapping tool for SUDA areas? The answer is actually no, but SUDA areas are defined. And so we use um, we use those that are listed. So if you've yeah. got a, a particular area, um, then you might want to check with us on that. A, a, SUDA, a SUDA area, certainly in the lower 48, um, there's a pretty close correlation between um, what is considered an Indian reservation. It's Indian tribal. Where, where tribes have jurisdiction over um, the territory, um, that those those would in the lower 48, those those usually would be easily identifiable as pseudos. In Hawaii, Hawaiian homelands are considered pseudo. In Alaska, it's get a little more complicated. There there are uh, Alaska Native Village corporations and Alaska Native villages. Um, 
And so the, the mapping of Alaska, you may need a little bit of uh, further research. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't have a comprehensive pseudo map that we're able to share, but it, as, as Bob says, um, it is well-defined. For PACE and New Era, is there a template for the environmental report that might be required for categorical exclusions listed in 1970.54? Um, Ken, I will let you take that. Um, the answer is kind of yes, um, but we will. it depends on what exactly the categorical exclusion is. Right, Ken? I, I, I can't find the question. Where is it? Okay, it's Catherine's question. For PACE and New Era, is there a template for an, the environmental report that might be required for CEs listed in 1970.54? Yes, the, the, well, the, what's considered a category exclusion is, will be, is described in 7 CFR Part 1970. If it's a, uh, if it's a, a category exclusion not requiring an ER, then that's going to be a 53, where there's no right. preparation and submittal of an environmental report required. But if it uh, exceeds a certain criteria or has certain concerns on the part of the environmental staff, they may require that an environmental report be, be prepared. But a lot of that is described in 1970. And I, right. I, and I encourage you to go to through that to read it. And we will go over with you once you start the environmental review process as to exactly what you need to provide. So, uh, and again, it's a little tricky question because each one of the 54s are a little bit different from each other, exactly what they might. Um, Dan asked a question, follow up on earlier question for grant only award for PPA project owned by a third party. Would NEPA be triggered if the grant is a project loan? Is only to no NEPA pass if it's a system loan? Okay. Okay. So, okay. Here's the, okay. Let me try this again. Um, if you have a PPA project, and I'm going to add a little word, verbiage to the question. So, if you have a PPA project where the assets producing the, generating the power are owned by a third party, would NEPA be triggered if the grant is a project loan or is the only path to no NEPA in a scenario where the system loan designation is for the grant? Okay, so system loan, project loan have nothing to do with NEPA. Uh, what triggers NEPA is if we are financing the construction of the project. In other words, if the federal government is financing the construction of the project. If you have an arm's length transaction with a third party vendor uh, and that third party vendor is going to provide you clean power, for you, our applicant, seeking financing for the PPA, you're not constructing anything. You are just buying the service, the product, the power. You're buying the electricity. Now, that is not to say that your vendor may have NEPA requirements of their own. But if, if this project is structured and, and, and again, the negotiation you have with your vendor is arm's length transaction, you, know, you have instructed this as a rent to own situation. Like I'm gonna buy power from you for 10 years under the PPA and then I'm going to own this on year 11. Well, then that would be a construction agreement. So that would not, uh, get you uh, out of uh, the NEPA requirements. So it's really about what you are doing as the applicant. And if you are just purchasing power, either from an existing facility or a to be built facility, um, then uh, in general, that's not gonna trigger uh, NEPA. But again, I'm gonna highlight italicize and under and underline and uh, is that your vendor may have NEPA requirements because of the source of their funding or the nature of their activity. But let me go back to Aaron Miller at 3.44 p.m. 
Okay. Asks, can you please clarify your positions on Rex? I think I heard Ken say that we need to retain the Rex, but Chris said developer can keep the Rex if it helps financial feasibility of the project. The answer to that is we the 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 PPA can include Rex, but it doesn't have to be for us to finance the purchase of the power from that uh, under that PPA. It may or may not include Rex. The point is that if it does include Rex and you want us to finance the Rex, the idea is that you would retain and retire those Rex, not sell them. It, you can also, we will all finance the power per power under a PPA that does not include Rex and whereupon the developer keeps the Rex. And what Chris is saying, that might be advantageous and economically for the developer who had passed on those because they could sell those wrecks and therefore make additional income on that and possibly pass on the savings from doing so to you. So that's it. Right. Um, Owen Engel has a question. Is there an updated NOFO or general overview that includes any additional updates? The, the NOFO itself has not been updated necessarily, but any uh, updates or uh, additional information so, is always yeah, Bob, posted me, on our website. Yeah, Bob, let me, uh, let me, we did do a NOFO update extending we the did. deadline. So, right. so we did publish that. And um, just be on the lookout. If there is to be a NOFO update, um, we, we will publish that. And so we are, we have had some, um, it's it's not and let me put it this way it's not impossible that another update might be forthcoming, um, but I'm not at liberty at the moment to say that one is coming. Um, so the best thing you can do is keep an eye on our website, um, sign up for those uh, notifications that we gave you the QR codes, and then um, you know ask any questions, but. But if there's going to be any future updates, we will um, certainly um, let you know uh, via the website. Um, and if it's a change in the NOFO itself, it's probably going to be in the Federal Register. Uh, or, and then we often amplify the Federal Register publications with a Sparks memo. All hey, right. Chris. I'm going. Hey, Chris. Yes. Uh, we, actually, we actually have a hand raised, so I don't know if you wanted to go over oh, that. Oh, please, yes. Why don't we go to the raised hand? Thank you, Tasha. It looks like they, they just lowered their hand, Chris. So oh, okay. You must well, answer the question. So I will, I will, we're, we're reaching the top of the hour and the end of this office hours, and I want to thank everybody. Um, I'm going to um, answer Justin's question here. Can PACE funds be stacked with other federal funding mechanisms, especially cost share grants or direct pay? Okay. So Justin, and this will, this will apply to new era as well for everyone in the listening audience. Uh, we are delighted if uh, any of our applicants can qualify for direct pay. We have limited anti-stacking requirements at RUS, the main one being that we're not going to pay for the same thing twice. So if another agency is paying for um, a specific piece of infrastructure, we're not going to pay a second time for that same piece of infrastructure. We, though, uh, are willing to stack our financing um, with other financing to be able to provide financing for a whole project or to feather financing so that we meet the other funding agency where maybe they leave off, provided projects are otherwise um, eligible, feasible, securable, and executable in the time frame. That said, RUS cannot um, speak for what the requirements are of any other federal agency. We know, for example, there are certain programs under the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law that are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Energy that do have restrictions on anti-stacking. So even though RUS may not have an objection, we want to make sure that the other funding agency 
um, doesn't have an objection and the project can stand. So please, we ask that you disclose to us um, whether there are any other state or federal uh, funding mechanisms included in your proposal um, or assumed in your proposal. And we will take that into account and we will have to verify um, that the stacking uh, you propose uh, would be permitted. But on the tax credits, we're all in. I think that's fairly clear between us and Department of Treasury um, that whatever you get on the tax credit side, that's, uh, that's a plus. Um, and there's, there's no limitation either way. So having reached the uh, top of the hour, I want to thank my colleagues who all participated. Um, uh, thank you, Claire and Jamie and Bob and Ken and everybody else. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody who has hung in with us uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, this is always very interesting. Please keep an eye on the website. We're going to have more FAQs published and more information available. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Good luck. Bye-bye.